Hello everyone, Michael here. This is part two of my Open Lab series, and today we're going to talk about the lab time simulation algorithm and build a simple lab time simulator in Excel. This will help us in the future when we start writing the code for Open Lab. We are going to be building a steady state lab time simulator. So first let's talk about what steady state actually means and how it compares to its bigger brother, transient simulation. Steady state means that the vehicle states are time independent. By assuming that the vehicle is at a steady state condition throughout the simulation, we can solve for the vehicle state at each point on the given trajectory independently of another and come up with the best lap right away. Transient, on the other hand, means the vehicle states are time dependent. So you need to know what happened in the past to be able to know what is happening now and what will happen in the future. The simplest vehicle model is a GG circle. If you plot the longitudinal versus lateral acceleration of a real race car, then you get something that looks like the shown plot. Now you can see something like a circle or an ellipse appearing inside this graph, and that is what we call a GG plot. The larger this circle or ellipse is, the faster the car is. In terms of the track, the simplest model you can create is a function of turning radius versus distance. The radius is infinite on the straights and has a real value whenever the vehicle is cornering. Let's now talk about the steady state algorithm itself. Now the main goal is to calculate the velocity profile of the vehicle and we will do that in four basic steps. First, we need to find where the apexes are and the speed at each apex. By looking at the green turning radius values on the right, with some intuition, we can say that these are going to be at the local minima. Now, we can accelerate the vehicle after each apex, filling in the red curves from left to right. And after we're done, we can decelerate the vehicle, which is like accelerating it backwards, filling in the blue curves from right to left. Again, intuitively, we can see that the breaking points should be at the intersections of the blue and the red curves, meaning that the final solution to our problem at each point looks to be the minimum value between all of the available solutions. With these four basic steps in mind, let's now solve this example problem. We are giving a vehicle with a cylindrical GGV plot, which just means that it collapses and becomes a, a circular GG plot. This in turn means that the vehicle can accelerate at any point towards any direction with a maximum value of 2G. Now we are told to run this vehicle at a very simple oval and calculate the lap time. So how do we start? Well, to solve the problem programmatically, we need a couple of more steps. First, we need to mesh the track or divide it into small segments. This will allow us to look at each turning radius at each point and locate the apexes by finding all the local minima. Then we will see that we can calculate the apex speeds directly. After that, by connecting the points between them, or should I say the nodes, with the vehicle's motion equations, we will be able to accelerate and decelerate it and get the final speed curve. Then we finally calculate the lap time. So let's mesh the track. Uh, by the way, all of my numbers will be in the SI system, meaning that lengths are in meters, velocities are in meters per second, accelerations are in meters per second squared, and so on. Um, we will calculate the velocity every 50 meters with some more nodes added at the start of each track segment um, just to be able to separate straights and turns correctly. Due to the simplicity of the problem, we can immediately identify the apexes. Turn 1 is shown in red and turn 2 is shown in yellow. Let's now open Excel and start calculating stuff. To save some time, I've taken the liberty to create a couple of tables and graphs that we can now fill in with the values and equations. The vehicle's GG circle radius will be included in cell B5 and the track model is included in cells C15 to E49 with column C being the distance step, column
column D being the position on the track and column E being the turning radius at each position. First, we'll set the GG circle radius, which is 2G. Now, by using the equation on the right, we can calculate the turning speeds. The equation is the square root of cell B5, which is the GG circle radius, Pre and I've pressed F4 to keep it constant whenever I copy the equation, times 9.81 to convert it into meters per second squared, times B9, which is the turning radius value. And I can copy this equation to the cell on the right. Okay, so it turns out that the cornering speeds are 44 and 31 meters per second respectively. Now, I'm going to copy these values in the table below, and keep in mind that I only fill in the cells of each row and column that correspond to the same turn for acceleration and braking. So I'll fill in turn one, and because the turning radius and everything else is constant throughout the turn, I will copy the speed to the rest of the cells for this turn. Okay, let's do the same for turn two. And deceleration, turn one. And deceleration from turn two. Okay, now let's accelerate. Every next point will be calculated by the equation on the right. The derivation of this equation will be explained in the next video. Okay, so there's a problem here. Which acceleration are we going to use? Well, because in this case the vehicle is either on a straight or a corner, we can use the complete GG circle radius directly. If it was in a combined situation, we would need to calculate what lateral acceleration is in use at each point and then use the friction circle or ellipse equations to find out how much more the vehicle can accelerate longitudinally to the next point. But here I'll just use the 2G that is available and I'll type in the top right equation uh, in the cell right below turn one. So the formula that I've typed is the square root of cell F28, which is the velocity at the previous position, previous step, and that is squared plus two times the GG circle radius, which is the B5, and I've pressed F4 to keep that constant whenever I copy the equation downwards, times 9.81 to convert the Gs into meters per second square, and then times dx, which is the distance step between the current and the previous point. And I'll copy it downwards. Now that I've reached the end of the lap, and because this is a closed loop circuit, I need to copy this value here to the starting line and continue accelerating from there. So let me just do that. Okay, so now that I've reached turn one again, the lap is finished. Let's do the same for turn two. Okay, now I'm done with acceleration and I'll start the deceleration sequence. You can see that the equation on the right for deceleration is basically the same as the previous one because now the acceleration value should be negative as we are going rearwards, um, so the minus sign gets cancelled out. So let's fill in the table, just in the opposite direction. And again, because I reached the starting line now, and the loop is closed, I need to copy this value to the finish line. And continue accelerating up until the end of the lap. Okay, let's do the same for turn two. Okay, now that I've 
completed the table, I need to move on to this column, which is the final velocity solution. So now I'm going to choose the minimum value between all of these cases. All right. So with this done, now we can make the assumption that the mesh size is small enough and that the speed remains constant between each point. And because distance divided by velocity yields time, we can calculate the needed time for the vehicle to travel between the nodes. In this case, the mesh size is very coarse, so this will be inaccurate, but if the mesh size is like one meter, for example, then it is going to be quite accurate. Now, finally, to calculate the lap time, we just need to sum up the time column. I'll do this here. And we're done. Now, on the right, we can see that the graphs have been automatically populated. And we can see the acceleration from turn one is blue. The acceleration from turn two is orange. Gray deceleration from turn one and yellow deceleration from turn two. And I've graphed all of those together in this graph. And then I've graphed the final solution in this graph. And you can see that it's basically the same thing by choosing the minimum values at each point. Okay, so this hypothetical vehicle can lap this hypothetical oval in 26.502 seconds. And the speed trace will look something like the one on the right here. Now, the breaking points are obviously between the intersections uh, of the acceleration and braking curves and are circled in red. What did we learn up to this point? Well, we obviously need some kind of vehicle and some kind of a track model. We also need to allocate in memory enough columns to store all of our solutions. This number turns out to be two times the number of apexes, one time for the acceleration sequence and one time for the deceleration sequence. And finally, for closed tracks, we need to connect the first and the last point to complete the loop. Now, what happens when the GTV map changes? For example, an F1 car can brake a lot harder at high speed due to the added downforce. And this means that the acceleration value that we kept constant in our example will now change depending on the value of the speed. It will also change in acceleration and braking as vehicles are usually power limited in acceleration and grip limited in deceleration. Well, all of this is going to be addressed in open lap. At this point, some of you might have a feeling that we can actually optimize our workflow a bit. Well, first of all, as shown in the lateral acceleration columns here, when the vehicle accelerates from one apex to the other and reaches the next apex, the lateral acceleration in it ends up needing to negotiate the turn is through the roof. At this point, we could have stopped the calculations as everything in the future that we will calculate will be wrong. In reality, we could have stopped even further back, but the thing is we did not know what the deceleration trace would look like before we started to take that into account. Also, every time we make a new speed calculation, we can check if, for whatever reason, there is a pre-existing solution from all of the other apexes that is lower than the current one. If so, we can just stop, as we're not going to choose a solution from this apex column anyhow. Finally, we can sort our apexes or let's rather say the order in which we fill in the columns in a way that will give us the best chance to not do unnecessary calculations. This is illustrated very well on the graph on the right. This graph just shows random velocity traces from another simulation that I've run in the past. You can see that the dotted curves are solutions from apex number three that has such a high apex speed that all of its values are higher than the ones calculated from apex number two. So if we sort the order of calculations depending on the apex speed, the solver will go through the acceleration and deceleration of apex number one and then the apex number two. So when the time comes to actually evaluate apex number three, it will immediately just jump to the next one, avoiding doing unnecessary calculations as the apex speed is higher 
than the Apex Speed Evaluator from Apex number two. And with that, I think this is the perfect time to call things an end here. I really appreciate you guys joining me in this episode. In the next video, we will talk about how we can model a vehicle in Open Vehicle and go through and explain its functionality. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.